Dames en heren, gasten van de WR, ik heet u allemaal van harte welkom bij deze WR Lecture 2012. De WR bestaat 40 jaar en het is mij daarom een groot genoegen dat ik u voordat ik overschakel op het Engels een boodschap mag voorlezen van Haar Majesteit de Koningin die hier had willen zijn maar niet kon zijn vanwege het staatbezoek van Slovenië. En zij schrijft het volgende. Aan de WRR. Van harte feliciteer ik u met uw 40-jarig jubileum. Ten behoeve van de beleidsvorming in ons land heeft de WRR in die vier decennia met zijn onafhankelijke adviezen belangrijke bijdragen geleverd aan het doorgronden van complexe maatschappelijke problemen. Op 22 november viert u het jubileum met een publieke bijeenkomst over het thema The Global Battle for the Future of Cyberspace. U heeft hiermee opnieuw gekozen voor een actueel en relevant thema dat velen zien als een van de grote uitdagingen waarvoor wij staan. Graag wens ik u alle een inspirerende gedachtenwisseling toe. Dat is natuurlijk Heel mooi. Dames en heren. I have explained our English speaking guests what the content was of the message of the Queen of the Netherlands. Uh, so you have taken it also with you. Uh, and then uh, for and foremost now I uh, want to say a warm welcome to our guest speakers uh, and panelists of today, uh, Professor Ron Diebert from Toronto, Mrs. Marietje Schaken from the Netherlands and also from the European Parliament, and Professor William Dutton from Oxford. For today's lecture in the year of the 40th anniversary of the WRR, the Scientific Council for Government Policy, we have chosen an intriguing, highly topical subject, the global battle for the future of cyberspace. While this is indeed a global issue of increasing importance and urgency, we feel that this issue should require much more attention also from the Dutch policy and political perspective. Uh, in the, the recent coalition agreement, there is uh, an important paragraph written uh, on increasing threats and vulnerabilities in the field of cybersecurity. And also the wish is expressed to counteract these by uniting efforts of all relevant parties, by strengthening early detection and response, and by adapting our legal instruments. And it's very important to put these plans in a global context of cyberspace, given fast technological uh, developments and innovations, and also in a grow growing world of cybercrime. We also face many activities of states in taking their part in this new area of power, uh, while at the other hand, uh, also putting new defense mechanisms, mechanisms in place to control the digital domain. In this context, key questions are how we can keep profiting from the good things the digital world is um, offering uh, and how internet freedom can be warranted in good balance between uh, these advantages at the one hand and cybersecurity at the other hand. These questions and related issues will be elaborated by our keynote speaker, Professor Ron Diebert, whom I'm happy to introduce to you now after having said that our two other discussions will be introduced later by council member Professor Corinne Prince, who will also lead the debate. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, professor Ron Diebert is Professor of Political Sciences and also Director of the Canada Centre for Global Security and uh, Global Security Studies and the Citizen Lab 
at the Monk School of Global Affairs of the University of Toronto. The Citizen Lab is an interdisciplinary research and development institute working at the cutting surface of the internet, international security, and human rights. Professor Diebert is also co-founder and research leader of the OpenNet Initiative and the Information Warfare Monitor projects. Needless to say that Professor Diebert did publish numerous articles and books of the topic, uh, on the topic of today. Uh, Professor Diebert, please take the floor. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to Corinne and Dennis, uh, Dennis and the rest of the organizers and to all of you for coming out today. Uh, it's an honor to be here in The Hague and it's a great honor uh, to be selected to deliver this lecture today. It does not take much more than the scanning of the news headlines today to see how cyberspace is affecting our lives. Not that long ago in the Middle East, we watched in amazement as cell phones, Twitter, and Facebook joined the lexicon of revolution, as opposition movements leveraged those tools to overwhelm the capabilities of state security forces and overthrow regimes that were once thought to be immovable. Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, after the dust settled, and once the secret files of these regimes were unearthed, a different picture has emerged. Outsiders learned that the Gaddafi and Mubarak regimes had access to a much more sophisticated arsenal of information monitoring tools, much of it supplied by Western firms. Since then, many across the region have complained of a creeping return of authoritarianism and censorship and surveillance online. And of course, the furor and violence following the Prophet Muhammad videos shows just how volatile the situation still is and how cultures remain far apart. These revelations have complicated the simple narrative of Western liberation technologies versus authoritarian regimes. The last chapter of the Arab Spring has yet to be written. Earlier this year, the New York Times confirmed what many already suspected, providing details on American and Israeli involvement in the Stuxnet cyber weapon that sabotaged Iranian nuclear enrichment facilities. If the reports are true, it, rec it would represent the first time a government has acknowledged using a cyber weapon to target a critical infrastructure, effectively crossing a Rubicon and an act of war in cyberspace that will be sure to have major international repercussions. The less lessons of Stuxnet will not be lost on other countries. Almost every week brings revelations of governments, corporations, and individuals being compromised by malware, leading to loss of confidential documents. Whether these breaches are being done systematically as covert espionage, or more randomly as a resistance to the machine, or both, is impossible to tell. Anonymous could be anyone, we don't know. It could even be the government. Addressing the challenges that cyberspace represents is fraught with difficulties, as each of these events throw up a myriad of policy, technical, and legal work that requires months, if not years, to understand and resolve. And yet the pace of events appears relentless, cascading, and continuously threatening to overwhelm policymakers at the national and international levels. If I said the term cyberspace 10 years ago, few in the audience outside of a few science fiction buffs would know that the term was invented by a Canadian science fiction writer, William Gibson, in 1982. Today, cyberspace is all around us. It penetrates everything that we do, think, and touch. It is our communications ecosystem, a technical artifact that went from being a research tool to a new kind of toy to now a total immersive environment. It is the fastest growing communications medium in world history, embracing more than two thirds of all humanity in less than 15 years. We've come to see cyberspace as inevitable, constant, always there, it's almost inconceivable to imagine the world before fiber optics, satellites, 
and cheap and always 24 by 7 connectivity. We have re-engineered our business and finance, governance and social relations around new information and communication technologies. Governments north and south have banked on the information revolution. Attention is now turning with urgency to securing this global domain. Whereas once the promotion of new technologies was widely considered benign public policy, today states of all stripes have been pressed to find ways to limit and control them as a way to check their unintended national security consequences. The Citizen Lab has had as its mission since its founding to lift the lid on cyberspace, to not take for granted what goes on beneath the surface, to apply an interdisciplinary research approach that combines technical interrogation, field research, and social and political analysis to find out what is happening inside the internet. We've been a kind of digital early warning system. And what we've observed over the last decade has been frankly troubling. Cyberspace is changing fast and not necessarily for the good. There is a global battle going on for the future of cyberspace as policymakers and others rush to deal with the governance and security challenges being thrown up at an exhausting pace. Although the problems vexing cyberspace today are serious and do require attention, what worries me most are not so much the problems themselves as much as some of the radical solutions that are being put forth to deal with them. In my talk today, I'm going to describe some major driving forces shaping cyberspace today and the overheated reactions to them. Fear is becoming the dominant force shaping cyberspace today, and as Samuel Coleridge once said, in politics, what begins in fear usually ends in folly. Now, cyberspace has always been characterized by change, but almost imperceptibly, there have been major shifts in the way it is constituted as a technical medium that are fundamentally important and are changing the very nature of this ecosystem just within the last three to five years. The rise of social networking, the shift to cloud computing, and the rapid emergence of mobile forms of connectivity. Social media growth has exploded. 80% of all internet users globally under the age of 35 are users of social network sites and media. These digital natives have turned their digital lives inside out, sharing what would have only a decade ago been considered intimate personal details with hundreds in their social networks. About 300 million tweets are posted every day, tens of billions since Twitter's launch. Here is my dog. This is my place of work. This is what I eat for lunch. These are my friends. This is my phone number. Individuals can be mapped in space and time with a degree of sophistication that would make the greatest tyrants of days past envious, mostly as a result of our own digital habits. Facebook just announced it has one billion subscribers. If that were a country, it would make it the third largest on Earth next to China and India. Cloud computing has untethered PCs and networks by virtualizing whole infrastructures. This shift is ease access to huge computing facilities for individuals and companies, but it raises significant jurisdictional and privacy issues. For example, very few citizens outside of the United States realize that their own data stored on Google servers, even those physically residing in their own country, are still subject to US Patriot Act provisions because Google is domiciled in the United States and the act compels Google to turn over its data when required, no matter where that data is stored. Mobile. Mobile connectivity has untethered us in physical space, but tied us down in a dense network of geo and temporal location data that follow us with relentless precision it is significant that of the 6 billion mobile devices in the world today, over 4 billion are located in the developing world. In 2001, just 8 out of 100 people in the developing world had a mobile subscription. Now, nearly 80 out of 100 do. In India, more people have access to cell phones than toilets. And demographics are key. Who is cyberspace? is as important as what is cyberspace. And the who 
is changing radically and fast. There is a major demographic shift occurring as a center of gravity moves from the north and the west of the planet to the south and the east. And the culture of cyberspace is changing as a consequence. While the West may have provided cyberspace with its original template, the West, collectively captured as the US and Europe, makes up just under 40% of cyberspace today. Presently, the Asian region comprises 45% of the world's internet population, which is the most by region, but it ranks only six in terms of penetration rates at 28% meaning that there's this enormous population yet to be connected, most of them young and unemployed. Some of the fastest growing online populations are emerging from the world's weakest states, the fragile and the failed for whom cyberspace is an empowering technology. But to understand how and in what way cyberspace will be characterized in years to come, we need to think beyond the beltway, beyond Washington, D.C., beyond Silicon Valley, and into the streets of Shanghai, Nairobi, and Tehran. If the internet as we know it today is largely a product of the drive, entrepreneurship, ethos, and norms inherent to that specific West Coast culture, we have to ask ourselves, what will the future of internet look like when the center of gravity for innovation and usage shifts to the south and to the east? These two forces are driving a third major one, the explosion of cybercrime. The rise of cloud computing, mobile connectivity, and social networking, while convenient and fun, are also a dangerous brew with many unforeseen consequences. Data that used to be stored on our desktops and in our filing cabinets are now entrusted to third parties beyond our control, perhaps in another political jurisdiction entirely than the one in which we live. This shift has happened so fast that institutions have yet to adopt proper security procedures. And so cybercrime, which has always been a low-level persistent nuisance on the internet, has exploded to the point of becoming a national security concern. Almost daily, some of the world's largest Fortune 500 companies and government agencies are breached, exposing highly sensitive information. Botnets that can be used to take down any website or adversary can be purchased from open forums on the web for as little as $100. Some even offer 24 by 7 technical support. Spyware that can be used to infiltrate networks is now so refined to the point of becoming a mass commodity. Ever since the internet emerged from the world of academia and into the world of the rest of us, its growth trajectory has been shadowed by the emergence of a gray economy that's thrived on the opportunities for enrichment that an open, globally connected infrastructure has made possible. In the early years, cybercrime was clumsy, consisting mostly of extortion rackets that leveraged blunt computer network attacks against online casinos or pornography to extract funds from frustrated owners. Over time, it has become more sophisticated, more precise, like muggings morphing into rare art theft. The reason for the sudden surge in cybercrime can be connected back to the previous two drivers. We have turned our digital lives inside out in an electronic web of our own spinning, but have yet to fully appreciate some of the unintended consequences. A hidden and massively exploding ecosystem is parasitically thriving off of our insecure data sharing practices, vulnerable browsers, servers, and websites. We are socialized to share through clicking, documents, attachments, hyperlinks. We click on website addresses and documents like mice clicking on pellet dispensers. And it is that condition tendency that cyber criminals and others can exploit with increasing precision. The underground economy of cybercrime shadows and exploits each new innovation, always at the cutting edge. Now, for example, security analysts are seeing a huge explosion in malicious software targeting, guess what, mobile applications and mobile phones. With the proliferation of end-user application developments comes ingenious end-user criminal applications that sub subvert and misuse the platform such as this Trojan, 
which masquerades as a battery performance indicator. It looks legitimate. But once installed, it connects back silently to the attackers who control every aspect of the mobile phone's internal working. Cybercrime thrives as well in part because of a lack of controls. It's elicited so little prosecution from the world's law enforcement agencies, it makes one wonder sometimes if a de facto decriminalization has occurred. And so not surprisingly, it's seen as a safe yet challenging way out of structural economic inequality by the burgeoning number of educated young coders of the underdeveloped world. It's become one of the world's largest growth sectors. Russian, Chinese, and Israeli gangs are now joined by upstarts from Brazil, Thailand, and Nigeria, all of whom recognize that in the globally connected world, cyberspace offers stealthy and instant means of enrichment. Now, not surprisingly, some governments have seen this malaise of the cybercrime underworld as a strategic opportunity and have exploited it for purposes of espionage. In the past two years, there have been increasing revelations of high-level penetrations against government departments, ministries of defense, economic interests across the world. If you look closely, though, what these penetrations share in common is that their basic techniques are largely indistinguishable from the tradecraft of cybercrime. The Citizen Lab has been involved in investigating several of these cases, two of which were published as major reports, the GhostNet report and the Shadows in the Cloud report. Our investigations began with alleged penetrations of computer networks at the Tibetan government in exile and the offices of the Dalai Lama. After many months of forensic investigation, our researchers found that not only were they indeed totally infiltrated, but the same people who had managed to infiltrate their computers had also done so to hundreds of government agencies, including prime minister's offices, foreign affairs departments, embassies, and international organizations like the United Nations. Among the victims of the GhostNet network, ASEAN, the Associated Press, the accounting firm Deloitte & Touche, the United Nations, the Taiwan Stock Exchange, the Iranian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and literally hundreds of others. Now, the attackers were able to compromise computers in all of these locations by means of social engineering techniques, typically by sending emails that are carefully crafted to entice the victims to open their malicious payloads. This is the letter received by one of the victims, in this case, the Dalai Lama's office, who cooperated with us in our investigations. As you can see, the letter appears to come from a sympathetic organization looking to provide support for a Tibetan publication. But this is not your typical spam from a Nigerian prince or an advertisement for Viagra. It incorporates real details gathered by the attackers from open information or previous compromises, giving the messages the appearance of authenticity. Typically, the victim is not aware, however, emails such as these contain a malicious payload that once executed, silently infects the computer and connects back to the attackers, who then install more sophisticated programs and instructions. What happens next is limited only by the imagination of the attackers. The spyware that the GhostNet attackers used, called GhostRat, allowed them to silently remove files from computers under their control, take screenshots and record keystrokes, and even turn on the audio and video capture devices, effectively turning the computers of unsuspecting victims into silent wiretaps. GhostRat can be downloaded from the internet for free today. It's open source and has been translated into multiple language interfaces to make it more user-friendly. With tools like GhostRat, we've entered the age of DIY cyber espionage. Now, Reports of threats like these and others have vaulted cybersecurity to the top of the international agenda. Fifteen years ago, if governments had any policy at all about the internet, it was laissez-faire or hands-off. Fast forward to today, and just about every country is urgently developing cybersecurity strategies out of a looming fear of those threats. If you live in the Middle East, this is what you're more likely to see today. 
building borders and putting in place controls has become the norm rather than the exception. To give an example from our research of the Open Net Initiative project, which documents internet content filtering worldwide, we have tracked a growth of internet censorship from a handful of countries in the early 2000s when we started to more than 40 today. And these moves to control cyberspace are not all passive, relying on building firewalls. All over the world, new stifling internet laws are being enacted. Governments are arresting controversial bloggers, filtering access to web content or even entire platforms like Twitter or YouTube. Many are enacting regulations that require the private sector to police the internet on their behalf, and often doing so at the expense of basic rights, freedoms, and due process. An example, the Indian Intermediaries Act of 2011, which among other things requires ISPs to screen out content that is, and I'm quoting here, grossly harmful, harassing, blasphemous, defamatory, obscene, pornographic, pedophilic, libelous, invasive of another's privacy, hateful, or racially, ethnically objectionable, disparaging, relating or encouraging money laundering or gambling, or otherwise unlawful in any manner whatsoever, or threatens the unity, integrity, defense, security, or sovereignty of India, friendly relations with foreign states, or public order, or causes incitement to the commission of any cognizable offense or prevents investigation of any offense or is insulting any other nation. A long list. When I read that, it begs the question, what is allowed in cyberspace in this, the world's largest democracy? Countries with these more nationalized visions of cyberspace controls are not just working domestically, they're coordinating regionally and internationally in forums like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and through the United Nations to legitimize and lend normative support for their domestic policies around censorship and surveillance. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization's regional anti-terror structure, known by its acronym, and I didn't make this up, RATS, has engaged in military and policing exercises designed to counter Arab Spring-like social movements from emerging in their respective countries. Now, not too long ago, many of you will remember, internet pundits mocked slow-footed authoritarian regimes and predicted their demise. But they have shown a resilience that belies the conventional wisdom. Our research has tracked the evolution of cyberspace controls from crude blocks on internet surfing in the early days to new, more adept generations of controls. Today, these regimes are getting more savvy about how to manipulate the space, including the private companies that operate it, to their advantage. Take the so-called green movement in Iran and its aftermath. In 2009, a social movement mobilized on the streets of Iranian cities and connected through networks of support around the world. Dubbed a Twitter revolution, the demonstra demonstrations achieved wider support for their cause and were able to organize through social networking, mobile and other internet technologies. But the Iranian authorities took countermeasures aimed at controlling the spaces online for resistance and dissent. And not just by censoring access to websites, they employed more offensive measures. The internet was slowed down in many cities, and there were periods when it was not accessible at all. It essentially ground to a halt. SMS messaging, mobile phone connections were suspended or jammed. Through evidence that has subsequently emerged, we now know that the Iranian authorities were able to get the cooperation of Nokia Siemens, the largest cell phone carrier in the country, who turned over user data to the Revolutionary Guard. Cyber organizers found themselves being targeted and arrested. Authorities also assembled a pro-regime army of bloggers, known as the Iranian Cyber Army, that hacks and defaces the websites and social networking platforms of the Green Movement. Families of protesters based outside of the country 
found their activities monitored, their websites watched. Part of the effort involves tracking the Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube activity of Iranians around the world and identifying them at opposition protests abroad. While it may once have been true to suggest authoritarian countries were too slow in plotting to deal with the flood of information, today the opposite is the case. Today the Iranian Revolutionary Guard uses a Facebook-type site in order to take down opposition. States are adopting repression 2.0 just as quickly as activists are moving in the other direction. Now, it would be a mistake to see this solely as an authoritarian, developing country problem. It most definitely is not. The reality is much more complex. The norms of cyberspace controls, in fact, are being driven and legitimized just as much by liberal democratic countries as others. In US, UK, Canada, in many European countries, new so-called lawful access legislation has been passed or proposed as part of the supposed necessities of cybersecurity. They share many commonalities, downloading controls to the private sector to police the internet, lowering, and in some cases, removing altogether the safeguards around sharing of data with law enforcement and intelligence agencies. It is now routine to hear of security agencies accessing ISP and telecom data without a warrant. Paradoxically, at a time when we are surrounded by so much data and information, liberal democratic governments are delegating responsibilities for the securing of cyberspace to the least transparent national security agencies, the NSA in the United States, GCHQ in the UK, CSE in Canada. Liberal democratic governments are also standing up cyber commands in their armed forces and now openly embracing offensive computer net network attack capabilities as part of their arsenal. Indeed, the concept of active defense, striking back at malicious networks in cyberspace, <clears throat> is now considered legitimate practice in both the private and public sectors, including, I understand, being debated here in the Netherlands. We are witnessing a classic arms race dynamic in cyberspace that other domains have witnessed. Land, air, sea, and space. But this time, the domain is something that we have created, that is our public space for engagement, communications, commerce, and education but which has now become ground zero for the Pentagon, the FSB of Russia, and the Revolutionary Guard of Iran. Unsurprisingly, a massive cyber industrial complex has mushroomed to service and profit from this arms race. Cold War giants like Boeing and Northrop Grumman are turning to cybersecurity, as are a bewildering and seemingly endless array of niche companies. Their wares are peddled at obscure international trade shows, typically restricted to law enforcement, intelligence, and the military. Policymakers are now given capabilities in their hands that they never before imagined. Deep packet inspection, social network mapping, cell phone tracking, geolocational surveillance, and even computer network attack tools. These products and services this market is not just reactive. As policymakers are given the products and services to do things that they never before even imagined, an epistemic shift occurs around the framework for rights and governments. What was inconceivable is increasingly considered routine. Lawmakers now justify radical changes to basic checks and balances on state surveillance as part of a supposed necessity of the digital age. They are also requiring the private sector to do more. The researcher Chris Segoyan has studied how these new laws affect corporate behavior and how some companies actually derive revenues from compliance with these laws, charging fees for lawful access. He notes that the volume of requests received by one wireless carrier in the United States, Sprint, grew so large 
that its 110-member electronic surveillance team couldn't keep up. So Sprint automated the process by developing a web interface <clears throat> that gives agents direct access to users' data for a fee. That website was used by law enforcement agents over 8 million times in a single year. And that market knows no boundaries. Over the years, we have uncovered that many of those countries who censor the internet rely on products and services developed by Western manufacturers. Citizen Lab contributed to reports that unearthed the use of smart filter in Iran in 2005. <clears throat> Fortinet in Burma in 2006. WebSense in Yemen, Tunisia, and the UAE in 2008 and 2009. All companies headquartered in Silicon Valley. In part because of the awareness raised by our reports, one of these companies, WebSense, has just recently issued a directive whereby they will no longer sell such products and services to regimes that violate human rights. We've also published several reports that detail how a Canadian company, NetSweeper, sells censorship products and services to ISPs in Yemen, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. In fact, NetSweeper stepped in when WebSense backed out. The Canadian company blocks access to human rights, news, gay and lesbian information, and information critical of the regimes. Another recent report of ours, building on the work of the hacktivist collective Telecom Mix, identified that devices manufactured by Bluecoat, an American company, were being used in Burma and Syria, not only to censor, but to isolate and identify particular types of communication traffic associated with pro-democracy activists in the context of what many consider to be crimes against humanity occurring in that country. Bluecoat first denied the findings, then conceded the evidence that they could no longer deny, which brought about calls for a US congressional investigation. Earlier this year, we released a report that identified a product called FinFisher, made by a UK company called Gamma Group that develops highly sophisticated network intrusion kits to the governments of Bahrain, Turkmenistan, Indonesia, and Brunei. After the report went public, the UK put Finn Fisher on an export control list. And just last month, we released a new report covered in Bloomberg News about an Italian company, Hacking Team, who sold computer intrusion kits to the United Arab Emirates government, which was then used to target a dissident who was jailed and beaten. US, Canadian, and European firms that used to brag in their ads about wiring the world are now secretly marketing capabilities that turn those wires into vectors for silent weapons of war and repression. And our research is really only picked at the surface of a major field. Products that provide advanced deep packet inspection, content filtering, social network mining, cell phone tracking, and even attack capabilities are being developed by these firms and marketed worldwide to regimes seeking to use them to limit democratic participation, isolate and identify opposition groups, and infiltrate meddlesome adversaries abroad. And that market knows no boundaries. We are already seeing Chinese, Indian, and Brazilian firms stepping into the same marketplace. Taken together, these driving forces, I believe, are threatening to subvert cyberspace's core characteristics and what made it good in the first place. What was once a domain characterized by openness and the free exchange of ideas is being radically reshaped by overreaction, a spiraling arms race, the imposition of heavy-handed controls, or through partition and cantoning as communities seek security through walled gardens. There is an, a danger that in an attempt to control usage and ultimately users, securitization may put at risk not just positive benefits of networking, but actually the integrity of cyberspace itself. Proposals being debated in liberal democratic countries include censoring the internet in response to copyright violations, giving secretive signals intelligence agencies responsibility for securing cyberspace, 
and loosening the protections around the sharing of data with law enforcement, delegating internet policing to the private sector, are all illustrations of such risks. Paradoxically, in the urgent desire to deal with very real threats, we may end up killing the internet in order to save it. Now, this is not the way it was supposed to be. Cyberspace's early architects foresaw a kind of digital agora that would fulfill long-standing democratic aspirations. With the internet, the whole human memory can be, and probably in a short time, will be made accessible to every individual. It need not be concentrated in any one single place. It need not be vulnerable as a human head or human heart is vulnerable. It can be reproduced exactly and fully in Peru, China, Iceland, Central Africa, or wherever else seems to afford an insurance against danger and interruption. Those aren't my words. They were written more than 70 years ago by H.G. Wells in his essay, The World Brain. Imagine if Wells were alive today to see how close we have come to achieving that dream, only, allow, only to allow fear to bring about its demise. We have indeed created a kind of world brain. The problem is that it is a typically aggressive, insecure, and all too human one. So what to do? Unfortunately, there's an instinctive tendency in security-related discussions to default to the tradition of realism, with its accompanying characteristics of state centrism, top-down hierarchical controls, and a defensive perimeter mentality. And we see this tradition mounting its powerful head all over cyberspace today. As compelling as it may be, however, it fits awkwardly in a world where divisions between inside and outside are blurred, threats can emerge as easily within as without, and that which requires securing, namely cyberspace, is a globally networked commons of information. There is an urgent need for the articulation of an alternative paradigm for civic networks. Now, for many who would characterize themselves as, as part of global civil society, the whole discussion around security may be seen as anathema. In today's worlds of exaggerated threats, it's easy to dismiss security as a myth to be demolished rather than engaged. Securitization is associated with the defense industry, Pentagon strategists, and the cybersecurity military industrial complex. Many might question whether employing the language of security only plays into this mentality and the growing might of cyberspace controls. But the vulnerabilities of cyberspace are very real. Dismissing these as manufactured myths propagated by some kind of power elite will only marginalize civic networks from the conversations where policies are being forged at the expense of liberal democracy. Civic networks need to be at the forefront of security solutions that preserve cyberspace as an open commons of information, protect privacy by design, and shore up access to information and freedom of speech, while at the same time addressing the growing vulnerabilities that have produced a massive explosion in cybercrime and security breaches. One alternative approach to security that meshes with the core values and decentralized architecture of an open commons has a long pedigree, might be referred to as the distributed approach. Like realism, it's not a new concept. It finds roots in liberal political orders reaching back to ancient Greece and the Roman Republic. And the late medieval, early Renaissance trade-based systems exemplified by the Venetians, the English, and right here, the Dutch. Distributed security finds its fullest expression in the founding of the early United States of America and the, writers, and the writings of the political philosophers associated with it, such as Montesquieu, Publius, and others. And then later, with the institutions of the European Union, including the Parliament, the Commission, and the institutions based here, like the ICJ and the ICC. Although multifaceted and complex, Distributed security starts from the foundation of building structures that rein in and tie down political power, both domestically and internationally, as a way to secure rights and freedoms. 
At the core of the distributed security model are several key principles, which in turn can form the basis for pillars of cybersecurity policy worldwide. Mixture, division, and restraint. Mixture refers to the intentional combination of multiple actors with governance roles and responsibilities in a shared space. Division refers to a design principle that no one of these actors is able to control a space in question without the cooperation and consent of the others. Each of these can provide a more robust foundation for the kind of empty euphemism of multi-stakeholderism and a principle upon which to counter growing calls for a single global governing body for cyberspace. Citizens, the private sector, and governments all have an important role to play in securing and governing cyberspace, but none to the exclusion or preeminence of others. Principles of restraint are perhaps the most important of those associated with distributed security and arguably the most threatened by overreaction today. Securing cyberspace requires a reinforcement of rather than relaxation on restraint on power including checks and balances on governments, law enforcement, and intelligence agencies, as well as the private sector. In an environment of big data, in which so much personal information is entrusted to third parties, oversight mechanisms on government agencies and the private sector are essential. Coincidentally, and most essentially, distributed security also describes the most efficient and widely respected approach to security in the computer science and engineering circles. Now, while these decentralized mechanisms are not perfect and will occasionally fail, they can form the basis of a coherent strategy, bottom-up, grassroots solutions to the internet security problems are consistent with principles of openness. They avoid heavy-handed centralized controls and provide checks and balances against the concentration of power in cyberspace. We're really at a crossroads. 50 years from now, future historians may look back and say, you know, there was that brief window in the 1990s or 2000s where citizens came close to building that global public sphere and then let it all wither. The social forces leading down that path are certainly formidable and appear to be inevitable, but nothing is inevitable. The future has yet to be written. We live in an increasingly compressed political space on planet Earth with many shared problems. To solve those problems, it is imperative that we have an open, shared, and equally accessible medium of global communications. To protect planet Earth, we need to protect the net. We are at a historical juncture where decisions could take us down a path where cyberspace continues to evolve into a global commons that empowers individuals or down another towards its eventual demise. Developing models of cybersecurity that deal with the dark side while preserving our highest aspirations as, as citizens is now an urgent imperative on a planetary scale. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron Diebert. Please take a seat or just stand. <laughs> um, I would like to invite our two speakers in the debate. Marietje Schaken, member of the European Parliament for D66, the Alliance for Liberals and Democrats, and Bill Dutton, professor at Oxford University, former director of the Oxford Internet Institute. A warm welcome to you both and join us in, uh, in the debate. Um, to, brief you, to briefly give you a bit of a background information, um, when Dennis Bruders and I started organizing on behalf of the VAR uh, this lecture, we started with uh, the promising perspective. A promising perspective given developments in the Arab world. Given the opportunities that internet offers us, offers them, the citizens of the Arab countries, but also people in other countries around the world, the promising new aspects of internet. We approached Ron Diebert, went to Canada, 
and said, well, Ron, give a lecture on the promising aspects and the opportunities of internet. And, and Ron said to us, well, not that quick. Something's happening there. And before entering into the debate on freedom of internet and the opportunities that are to see there, I do want to shed a light, and you did, in an impressive way, in an impressive manner. I do want to shed a light on what's actually happening in that world. The things we don't see while using our mobiles, we're using the internet. You sketched, as I said, an impressive perspective on that, but, but finished with a hopeful message. The networked approach. And I first would like to give the floor to Professor Bill Dutton. Um, Bill. You explored the idea of the fifth estate in yeah. your work at Oxford. Um, given the concept of a networked strategy uh, for cyber, how do you see your concept of the fifth estate? And perhaps you could explain to the audience a bit okay. what's behind it. How do you see both? And can the perspective of a fifth estate uh, mean something uh, in light of the plea Ron just presented to us? Okay. Floor to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I think the, the topic of this session was, is actually incredible. The global battle for the future of cyberspace. I couldn't agree more that this is a this is a key topic. I think I will give the promising, <laughs> the more promising view. Uh, but although I, it, it's quite incredible. You have a very chilling presentation that ends up being somewhat optimistic about the future. I, I'm very. I, I think I have a bright view of what we all know as the internet and what, and what it can be, but I, I'm very pessimistic about uh, the approach that you're recommending. And so I think I'll uh, try, to, try to balance those, in, and I've been instructed to stick to five or, five or six minutes. So. Yeah, it's a debate, so that's why. Uh, yes, so let me, um, let me just say that, first of all, the fifth estate is, is, resonates very well with some of... Uh, uh, Ronald's points. Um, of course, the internet empowers criminals. It, it, it empowers many, many actors. Almost every institution in the world is, is, is increasingly being supported by the internet. Journalists, politicians, uh, 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 school children. Uh, it's hard to imagine a child going to school and not being disempowered if they don't have access to the internet today. Um, it is, an, it is becoming a primary source of information for, and it's the first place people go for information when they have access to the internet. Uh, it is it's becoming so important that it's, uh, uh, it's enabling networked individuals to source their own information and to source their own networks, that is, people who they choose to associate with, in ways that it's truly empowering the networked individuals. Um, in a way that uh, I've actually talked about the fifth estate as the idea that uh, individuals are enabled to be empowered and, and to hold other institutions, other, other actors accountable for what they, uh, what they do and what they say uh, to a degree that, that in the 21st century they are creating a fifth estate that is comparable in every which way to uh, the fourth estate, the press, in earlier centuries. Um, so there's this, this positive role of, of the fifth estate is very much in, in line with the notion of checks and balances and, and the diverse distribution of power. It has a pluralist view of, of control. Uh, and the internet is enabling this kind of more pluralistic uh, potential for accountability on the part of networked individuals, which could be the, what is killed by approaches, in a, if we don't ap approach the internet uh, and the problems of the internet correctly, uh, when uh, Professor Debert says we're, we're, we could kill, the, the baby is going out with the bathwater, we could, the fifth estate may be history if we, if we, because it depends on freedom of expression, of feelings of privacy online, the ability to be anonymous on occasion in order to hold other institutions accountable. Here's the problem. Um, I don't think, uh, restraint is not happening, all right? Uh, as, as you said, states are piling in. All the various uh, checks and balances, legislatures, judicial uh, courts, uh, 
intelligence agencies uh, are rushing in to regulate and control cyberspace. Un and not, it's not going to create new laws. They're using existing law and policy in order to do this. Copyright, liability and defamation, child protection, um, uh, anti-terrorism legislation and so forth. So the law exists there in order to um, exert control over the internet. The problem is not that it shouldn't be done, but that it's being done in inappropriate ways, in my opinion. Um, and the best example of that is you, one you mentioned, which is, is basically relying on intermediaries, search, search engines, um, uh, social network providers, to surveil users and, their, and therefore to play a role in surveillance of the public uh, uh, in order to support governmental uh, uh, law enforcement policy in these areas. This is done in China, of course. Uh, that's uh, a key approach of China in terms of supporting inter controlling intermediaries to provide gov to do what the government wishes, but it's also prevalent in the Western world. As, um, as Professor Diebert said, the, many of these uh, poster childs of, uh, of of surveillance and so forth are in the, the new internet world, but the population in the new internet world, the people, net internet users, which outnumber the old internet world now of the, of the West, uh, North, North America and Western Europe, are more as concerned, if not more concerned about freedom of expression than people in the old internet world. People in Western Europe and North America are becoming complacent about freedom of expression, complacent about privacy online, because they, uh, I guess, taking it for granted. In the new internet world, there's much, there is even greater support for freedom of expression because they realize the internet is bringing them something that the other media do not. Um, I don't think distributed security, I don't see how that will work. I think it should be devolved security. I think that we should think more and more about trying to move security closer to the individual and the household. Uh, home hubs and home, home technology that allows families, households, individuals to regulate their own, uh, sec help secure them, but also help regulate their own filtering and uh, censorship is, is, is devolving security, not, not distributing it to more actors. Um, and I would think what we, we have to do th three things. One is to devolve security. Secondly is to enhance legislation that would enable more competition among the intermediaries, uh, social networks, search engines, uh, it, with, with more competition and, and national and international levels, uh, market forces will actually have a, a better chance of, of, and already they work fairly well in getting uh, uh, these intermediaries to address privacy concerns and other concerns of users. And the third is, I think we don't need a new paradigm for security. We need a, a new paradigm for regulating this new media, uh, the internet. Co countries around the world are looking at the internet as if it's broadcasting. It's an overly simplistic model. And therefore, that's the idea of regulating the intermediary. You, you press the intermediary, the broadcaster, to regulate content, to do what you wish, okay, to control content, to give you the uh, information about users. It's not broadcasting. What, 72 hours of video is posted every minute on YouTube. Uh, this is, cannot be regulated like broadcasting. It cannot be regulated like a newspaper either, or a common carrier. We need a new paradigm for understanding this new medium that will not apply, uh, apply inappropriate regulatory models to this baby, the internet, that is actually uh, uh, giving birth to this fifth estate, which I think can really help liberal democratic and also autocratic regimes uh, uh, to become more accountable. Uh, it is true, no single country, no single autocrat can control the internet. I used to preach reinforcement politics, but now it's clearly impossible for any single country or any single government official to, be, to even think that they can control the future of the internet and its implications for their country or their, their regime. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back to that.
that final issue later on. Marie Schaake, um, welcome. Um, restraint is not going to happen. That's what Bill Dutton in introduces into the debate. Um, being a member of parliament, um, perhaps you could, well, first shed your light on, on what um, the, the lecture has given us, but also perhaps give it a bit more hands and feet in the sense of what does it mean in actual practice? Um, with these huge challenges, how do you deal with them in the European Parliament? What do you see there? Well, thank you very much uh, to the VRR, first of all, for putting this very important topic on the agenda and for Professor Diebert for so eloquently introducing this, uh, this discussion. I think it was a great overview of some of these enormous challenges in which I indeed recognize a sort of transition from uh, on the one hand, enthusiasm of the sense of empowerment of people and what it might mean for democratization and freedom. Uh, and on the other hand, this reality check that also uh, came, uh, I remember well in 2009 when I was elected myself, it was also the uh, elections in Iran where we saw all these young people taking to the streets asking where is my vote. Uh, and when we look today, uh, Iran is uh, almost done completing an intranet, a completely nationalized, centralized, heavily censored, uh, surveyed and controlled internet. So perhaps the internet cannot be controlled, but governments are surely trying to reclaim, reclaim and regain control uh, over the territories online and offline where they can. Um, and so I think a lot has to be done. I also share the sense of urgency, uh, but we have to do so in swimming against the current. I don't really see policymakers rushing in as much uh, to, to work on this issue. Only this morning I was um, uh, talking to a colleague of mine who's a prominent member of the European Parliament working on foreign affairs, and I urged him also in light of election opportunities to, uh, to take on board uh, the sub subject of digital freedom and technology in the context of foreign policy. And there's also real fear among lawmakers because they think it is quite complicated and they don't really know where to start. Um, and so from our perspective and the perspective of lawmakers and governments in democracies, I would like to share a few thoughts of what it looks like from the inside, uh, where I do believe that this lack of knowledge makes people, uh, one, hesitant to take action and two, uh, susceptible to lobby, of course, because if there's not a knowledge and an ability to critically assess information that is fed into the policy making process, uh, that's a real danger. And so as we see um, the empowerment of, of individuals and monopolies of information and power, media and politics being uh, eroded, we have to wonder where is this power redistributed to? So one, on the one hand, indeed, to the networked individuals or networks of individuals. On the other hand, certainly to companies uh, and to others, uh, sometimes with good and sometimes with bad intentions. Uh, and we are dealing with a global, global space, global sphere, global environment, global connectivity. But our mandate, the mandates of governments, even the constitutional responsibilities, are linked to the nation state and the jurisdiction that applies. Uh, and that is a real tension, increasing ten tension, which I believe leads to a challenge of the core tasks that governments have to perform, even their core and very, very primary responsibilities. Um, and so while governments across the world are losing power to some extent uh, as a result of the uh, vast developments in techno technologies and, and the internet, they're trying to either regain control uh, in many cases and sometimes they even extend it voluntarily or involuntarily. Um, and sometimes this happens uh, through companies, uh, for example, companies like Google that have been mentioned or Facebook or others that are used by so many people but that are incorporated in the United States. Uh, actually fold people into the jurisdiction of the United States uh, to some extent. Um, and this is also the case for laws. Sometimes uh, laws are sought to be applied beyond the, the nation uh, and beyond the territory. Uh, Professor Diebert mentioned the um, Patriot Act of the United States. With the emergence of cloud computing and the uh, wider use of it, this will be a very, very interesting issue. Who has ultimate responsibility? Which interests are being fought out in these sort of virtual um, spaces? And sometimes we also benefit this kind of benefit from this from this global sphere. I mean, there's policies being designed specifically to try to uh, allow people in countries like Iran, but also China and other restrictive environments to access information beyond what their governments might want, uh, beyond what the laws of that country might, uh, might uh, enable. 
And so there's really pluses and minuses here, and um, um, well, the, the balance between uh, seeking to re-territorialize, so reclaim control along the lines of the nation state, and rather to keep the internet open, I think are, um, are essential in our policy discussions, and we have to realize that what we do uh, can, can come back to us as a boomerang, uh, and that our own credibility is very much at stake. Um, not long after, in the United Kingdom, the government proposed to limit the use of instant messaging after the riots emerged there. Uh, help was offered for crowd control by uh, Iran and China. And so what we do at home directly impacts our credibility on the global stage, although, um, uh, as I mentioned, governments may have one policy with certain intentions, uh, and companies can go uh, a completely different way, even directly undermining the policies um, of, of a country or of the European Union, for example. And so I believe it's very important that we look on the one hand on how technologies work, uh, what their implications can be also when they're unintended, uh, and we look at what context they can end up in. I think the uh, professor uh, also mentioned the uh, idea that's been floating around uh, in this country a couple of weeks ago uh, to allow the authorities to hack back. Um, but the idea of uh, developing such technologies, perhaps in the context of uh, a country like the Netherlands, where the rule of law uh, protects people from, from the state as well, has a completely different meaning in a country where there is no rule of law. And we see this on a daily basis. It's a European legal technical requirement to have lawful intercept capabilities built into technological devices. So this means that the police is able to place a tap or otherwise uh, use the signals coming out of a phone to localize people, for example. But placing these devices in a context without the rule of law, you effectively open a technological backdoor on a permanent basis. And we know that activists have been confronted with excerpts of all their mobile conversations, text messages, emails, uh, social media uh, updates, uh, private and public, uh, while they were tortured. I mean, piles of paper linking people to each other had already been compromised. So it's important that we ask more transparency uh, on the part of companies. What are they developing and who are they selling these technologies to? And also accountability. Um, there is a risk that there is kind of a, a policy vacuum, uh, and I see this especially in, in terms of transparency and accountability of companies. On the one hand, this is because technologies develop so rapidly um, that there's hardly any way to keep up, but contrast that with the relatively slow pace, for good reasons, uh, of democratic decision-making and law changes. Uh, and this is, this is a serious problem that uh, will probably only get worse. And now we see the fights or the uh, de facto application of laws being fought out in courts, um, but also in the market. Um, simply by the development of new products, new lines of responsibilities kind of creep in different directions without any uh, regulation or oversight. Uh, and one of the latest arenas for these sort of power struggles uh, and claims of control are international organizations dealing with internet governance. Um, next month, the um, uh, International Telecoms Union will convene in Dubai, and some of the proposals on the table from, on the one hand, States like Russia and China, which uh, have displayed in many ways their, their need to control <clears throat> flows of information and people also through the use of technologies, which then seek to um, regulate through international organizations these kinds of mechanisms and mandates. And on the other hand, companies that seek to secure their uh, business models, their profits and their influence. So the arenas where um, the de facto jurisdiction or power or uh, rights are being fought out are uh, increasingly outside of the democratic decision-making process, and I, I worry about that. Okay. Um, it might be that to, to, to um, many of us, among me, myself, uh, it's a rather far-fetched topic. I mean, it's far away, it's, we don't see it, we don't feel it, we don't touch it. We don't see the, the implications in our day-to-day -day, uh, world. And of course, uh, all of us have, from a different professional perspective, our res responsibility in dealing with it and perhaps in, in taking up the networked approach. But um, perhaps it's a bit of an impertinent question, but, but to make it really down-to-earth, um, 
um, what about open data or what about sharing in Dropbox, uh, things like that. Should be more, be me more hesitant in that respect? Um, are we, as individual citizens, as in individuals sitting here among us, um, too naive? Uh, and that's part of the problem as well. Um, yeah? Uh, I'd, the cloud. I'd like to answer that. Be before I answer that, though, I'd like to say that uh, it's an honor also to be on this panel with uh, Bill and Maricha, who I'm big fans of both. And I think, uh, you know, when I when you mentioned they were going to be on the panel, I said, I don't think we'll have much of a debate between us. And uh, when I, listening to them, I think that we're pretty much on the same page, maybe in the margins, some, some differences. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to respond to, to, to Bill's point a bit later, because I think it's a very important point. But just getting to yours about the technologies we take for granted, I, I think there is a, a, most people today treat the internet and cyberspace as there's a great quote, I think it's from Buckminster Fuller, uh, that any technology, once it reaches a, a certain stage of sophistication, might as well be magic. And I think this is how most people treat it. When they send an email, it just whoosh, it goes off into this ether. And um, in fact, the, the whole philosophy of the Citizen Lab that I founded was to not take the technology for granted, to actually begin to peel back the layers. And over the years, what we have found really has uh, uh, shown that power is exercised beneath the surface of the technologies we take for granted in our day-to-day -day life. I'll give you one anecdote. Uh, I'm sure most people in this room use Skype as a matter of practice. In 2008, one of the researchers in the mm. Citizen Lab heard reports from users in China that when they were typing in certain keywords, they just wouldn't appear on their chat client, like Tiananmen Square, or democracy, or even human rights. And uh, so he set up an experiment in the lab to look at this more closely and began systematically entering in these banned keywords. When he put in some of them, and a connection was being made, he noticed using a network sniffing tool that we use in the lab, the connection was being made to a computer in mainland China. That shouldn't have been happening. It's not in the end user license agreement or the terms of service. And when we went to the server, we visited it, took a look, the people behind it made a few mistakes allowing us to see the contents. There were four million personally identifiable chats that were stored on that server by the Chinese manufacturer of Skype. The story was really scandalous. It was uh, given prominent attention in the New York Times and world media. This is 2008. Uh, we have recently got together with researchers at the University of New Mexico. They said, would you be interested in re-exploring this case? So over the last six months or so, we've been doing this, and we've found not only is it still going on, it's actually more elaborate, with the number of keywords changing dynamically almost every week in response to current events in China. So if you type in Boji Lai, uh, not only may it be filtered, but it would trigger surveillance of all of your communications over Skype. And internet users in China are very sophisticated and savvy about this, so they have a way of creating new memes and ideas that are maybe subtle shifts on sounds to get around the filtering. So next time, instead of Boji Lai, they might say something that sounds like that that means something different. Those keywords are getting triggered and surveillance is starting. It affects not only users of the Chinese version of Skype, but users of regular Skype who communicate with them. I think now, four years later, when we publish this report, it actually won't be that scandalous because when it happened in 2008, people were shocked. A company is colluding with a foreign government like China to monitor Skype traffic? Now I think people are beginning to realize it's not only China where this is happening, it's happening all over the world uh, using technologies that we take for granted. In some cases, in liberal democratic countries, actually being enshrined in law. So um, in giving this lecture and, and thinking through some of these ideas, and I guess this gets back to Bill's point, I think it's really the liberal democratic countries that uh, personally I think we need to focus on here because we're losing sight of what makes a liberal democracy a liberal democracy in the first place. And if we do that here, we cannot turn around and say to Iran, you know, when you asked Nokia Siemens to turn over data about the Green Movement and it led to the arrest and detention and beating of protesters, that was wrong because they'll turn around and say, well, you can't do that. If, you, if you're doing it in your country, why can't we do it here? 
Um, and that is why I think we need to get back to some core principles. You know, the ideas that I laid out here, distributed security, are not new. We don't need a new cyber theory. We need to just re-impress and invoke some timeless principles that go back to ancient Greece. In terms of distributed versus devolving, I'll just say one point about that because I think it's an important question. When I started the research that I did, it was common, and I was coming from a security background into this topic area in the 90s, and I saw so many people, especially in civil society and in NGOs, uh, well-intentioned people who were taking the technology for granted. They said, you know, this is a magical new powerful force. Governments will not be able to control it. I was very skeptical. Uh, coming from a security background, I thought, that doesn't seem right to me. I know there are powerful forces. They may lurk in the shadows, but if they reappear and, and attempt to exercise control, the things that you take for granted that empower you may not be there. And uh, this is why I think we need to reinforce that governments matter, government laws matter, oversight matters. If we put it forward as an alternative, total government control versus the complete absence of government, government I think that you're, you're assuming that the basic levers of government really are ineffective when I think they're being misapplied now. We need laws, we need regulations to protect privacy, to protect security, to ensure that there's competition in the marketplace. And that's just not being done. Okay. Mm -hmm. Bill, quick. Yeah? Okay. I, I, the example uh, Professor Deber gave of the, of the individuals, uh, Chinese students and professors in Canada and so forth, networking among each other to expose what was going on in China is an example of the fifth estate. This is at work. The other, and this is the danger that we might forego sharing. Sh uh, sharing information is so powerful. I mean, we have tried to get governments to share information for decades, and they're finally starting to do it with some calamities, uh, uh, computers left on trains, things like that, data breaches, because they don't have the protocols to do it, but they're learning. But on the internet, sharing information through social net media, search and all sorts of techniques are, is a very powerful uh, mechanism for collaboration, um, doing things that we could not have imagined doing. The people who are most frightened about sharing are people who have never done it, okay? The people who are frightened about social media are those who don't have experience on social media. And uh, uh, that's not just in the Western world, but worldwide we find that same pattern. Uh, so. This is the danger, that we start worrying about sharing data. What happens is if you share data with others, that's not a problem. It's when somehow a government agency can have access to that without a real criminal warrant to say, we have reason to believe that there is a problem here and we would wish to see a specific individual's data files, so forth, just as in telephone tapping or something. But, um, the danger is uh, unauthorized un and, and really uh, 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 exorbitant uh, government access to data that's collected for other purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I saw Ron wanted to react well, just, uh, to that maybe, one, but each also. Maybe there are some areas where we will disagree <laughs> after all, because I think that quite the opposite, uh, people who are becoming really chilled and concern and have security fears are the users of social media and social networking technologies today, in my experience, because they're learning that they can, the use of them can really now put them in jeopardy as governments develop techniques to infiltrate and monitor them. I'll give you two examples. The Green Movement we already took, up, uh, t took up, uh, but I think it's, it's worth repeating. Where is the Green Movement today? You know, why has there not been an Arab Spring in Iran? I can tell you that part of the reason is because of the way the Iranians have responded, the Iranian regime. Uh, they've dropped a poison pill in that networking well. And I know I work a with Iranians very closely in the Citizen Lab. Uh, there is a great deal of paranoia and fear in going back to those tools that they started out with. Another example, the Pink Chatty campaign in India. Uh, there was a campaign uh, involving actually colleagues of mine, uh, mostly women, 
who were uh, networking to raise awareness about some of the extreme right-wing policies going on there, and they created this campaign called the Pink Chatty or Underwear Campaign uh, to mock one of these right-wing politicians, nationalist politicians. They used Facebook as their platform of organizing. Um, eventually, what happened was hackers working in sympathy with the right wing in India infiltrated their uh, networks to the point where it became unusable to them. They made complaints to Facebook. Facebook never looked into the matter. At the end of it, the organizers issued a statement saying, you know what, Facebook actually doesn't help us. We're, we're getting off. Uh, that's not to say that these tools are, you know, I think we're in agreement. I wouldn't be doing what I do if I didn't think there are powerful implications here. But the problem is we just can't take them for granted any longer. They're changing fast as well. Okay. Um, Marie, before giving you uh, uh, the floor, a, a more specific question. Um, our chairman referred to the, the recently uh, presented uh, program of our cabinet, uh, referring to cybersecurity as a prominent theme in there. But internet freedom is not mentioned. Um, could yeah. you perhaps elaborate a bit, because it's a central theme in, in Ron's lecture, the, the, the dilemma between, on the one hand, cybersecurity steering there, uh, controlling there, and on the, one, on, the, on the other hand, internet freedom. Um, yes. and perhaps you could bring it also back to the Netherlands and the implications. Yes. Uh, well, the whole world, word internet was not mentioned in the uh, government program once, which is very interesting. Uh, a missed opportunity, uh, I would say. Um, but I guess I think one of the risks is when you talk about cyberspace, cybersecurity, is that it all seems to be like a different world, uh, an issue of technologies, a different sphere from, from our own lives, our own responsibilities, and what can happen to us. And as policymakers, we must put people first, not the technology. I think that's really important. And so when you constantly think about what the use of a technology might mean, uh, if it doesn't turn out the way you'd like to. So you may have an intended scenario and then there may be in unintended consequences. Uh, this needs to be factored into the way which we deal with policies and control of, uh, of for, for example, production processes much more. So um, I think we should, you mentioned briefly, I think, um, privacy by design, but I think we should expand this to uh, look at human rights by design because a lot of technologies are not designed with the potential negative consequences in mind or even with a democratic process in mind or with, with the values in mind that we hold dearly and that we want to defend. And so if we do not think about the consequences for our freedoms and we, we think that more control, more security um, will work, then we're indeed going to uh, strangle the very values that we care about. And so the risk of seeing a zero-sum uh, relation between security and freedom is a real one. Um, and so I think we should take it, take it back a step uh, and start already assessing technologies in the research and development phase, for example, and look at that context. Uh, if it is lawfully used in our country, but what if it, it leaks or gets, gets into the hands of our, uh, our you know, uh, adversaries or our enemies, what could that mean? And specifically coming back to this proposal to develop hacking tools or to uh, allow those to be proactively used by government, I mean, there's a lot... Uh, of question marks uh, that that raises immediately uh, in terms of people's fundamental rights, uh, clearly, and protection uh, from government as well. Uh, but imagine that these tools uh, would end up in the hands of, let's say, the Syrian government uh, that we know today, which is clearly unhappy with the European Union because we are so uh, outspokenly <coughs> against uh, their attacks on citizens and their uh, use of violence. Um, this government of Syria has already shown a very sophisticated use of technologies to repress, uh, both by using um, infiltrating technologies, but also by inviting people to use social media, to share more information, by creating a sense of openness for a brief period of time, and then using all that shared information to map networks of opposition, uh, to identify individuals, etc. So what, what would happen if this technology would end up in the wrong hands and would be used against us? I think there is absolutely not enough thinking about those potential consequences. And we see that the consequences in other places can be much more real. Uh, another Dutch example is the DigiNotar uh, yeah. issue of certificates of websites that are technically required to verify authenticity, um, was reported from Iran. 
because activists in Iran started noticing that there was something wrong and that they may not actually be on the real sort of Gmail uh, web service, but, but on another site. So the global context is very important. Okay. okay, a lot of problems, a lot of challenges on the table, but now the answers and the solutions, that's not easy. Um, a key pillar was restraint in your um, uh, lecture. Another is mixture, different actors. Uh, Bill referred uh, or mentioned we can't do it alone. We need to do it together. Um, in the Netherlands, we've got here the Cybersecurity Council, uh, which is an, an, a tentative step, an important step in working towards a concept with mixture. Um, um, cooperation between the private sector, the public sector, and academia to, to address cyber uh, crime. But nevertheless, in, in taking up the challenge of a networked approach, um, and who's to shake the hand of whom in that? Um, someone has to take the lead. Someone has to take the initiative. Um, if you were to be invited to, well, elaborate on how to make it work, how to realize the first tentative steps, the initiative, what would you do in two minutes? <laughs> Marie. Oh, okay. Thank, thank goodness she started. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's okay. I thought about this before. <laughs> I cheated a little bit because I've been working on a, a strategy for the EU on digital freedom for the past year. So uh, thankfully, this is not the first time I've thought about this. Um, and before coming, presenting in, in two minutes a few ideas that I think we concretely um, uh, execute, I do want to caution against over-regulation in general. I think uh, that not every problem needs a rule or a law. Uh, but one of the things that we are working on in the European Parliament um, is export controls of technologies that can be misused to um, violate people's human rights or to act against our own uh, strategic interests. Um, while there's a lot of jokes about the European Union's tendency to determine how tall um, ladders should be or how uh, wide or uh, bent cucumbers can be, there's very, very few uh, rules of uh, ensuring transparency and accountability on the export of technologies, and that needs to change. Um, then I would propose um, this human rights by design idea to be mainstreamed, uh, and I think that vulnerabilities or exploits, so breaches in mainstream uh, software that people are using, uh, should be reported so that companies need to report where the vulnerabilities are. Um, and I also think that we need to think more about who is responsible in what case. Uh, you've mentioned kind of a segmented approach to security, but I think we should think about clusters of w several kinds of layered responsibilities. So who do we need at the table when we're dealing with, let's say, national security issues? Or who do we need at the table when we are dealing with um, the responsibilities of internet service providers, for example? So if you think about the, the cyberspace as a layered environment of different uh, jurisdictions or spheres of influence, as well as different players, then I think there would be uh, a lot of benefit in, uh, and perhaps the VR Air can actually play a role in this, um, in exploring some uh, scenarios and uh, drilling down deeply into, you know, um, the, um, the cases that we know. So, for example, a company that is accused of um, violating intellectual property rights under American law uh, is, is a suspect in a criminal case, but the owner of the company uh, lives in New Zealand and the company is registered um, in France, but uh, ran on uh, British servers, for example, and the clients are all over the world and their data is stored uh, in a cloud. Okay. What does that mean? Two minutes. Yeah, thanks for two minutes. <laughs> uh, to add something, um, and it leaves you with three minutes, um, are there, suppose you were to invite people actors for your mixture approach. Are there people, institutions, organizations that are not uh, automatically in sight, that we forget, um, almost automatically forget, um, when thinking about solutions and how to deal with it? Um, I mean, are certain actors not represented? Well, they must be represented. Um, 
Well, I'm usually gonna... those who aren't thought about in these contexts have three-letter agencies. They come from three-letter agencies, and they wear uniforms, and they decide things behind closed doors. <laughs> um, I say that kind of facetiously because uh, one of the issues I would raise is that we need greater oversight over signals intelligence. Uh, there's a strange historical development. I, these behemoth uh, agencies that were born during the Cold War and that developed huge capabilities, extraordinary budgets to essentially monitor communications, beginning with each other as adversaries, have now become the leaders in many countries when it comes to defining cybersecurity. This to me is unacceptable, and I think it needs to be squarely addressed. It wasn't that long ago that you couldn't even bring up the National Security Agency in conversations openly. Uh, so I, I think that those, those agencies need to be brought into the conversation, actually. Um, and it's one of the things that we have tried to do at the University of Toronto for the last two years, beginning and starting again next year, uh, we're hosting a cyber dialogue. Uh, Maricha came to the last one, which was about the concept of stewardship in cyberspace. And the aim of that was precisely to bring together communities and stakeholders that don't normally talk to each other. Uh, so we had lawmakers, uh, but people from private sector, people from civil society, and people from the national security, defense, and law enforcement areas. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important for civil society people to understand the very real problems that those agencies have to deal with. For example, cybercrime. It's a very real issue. Uh, those of us who stand up here and talk about internet freedom and openness have to have a solution for the issues that law enforcement raise mm -hmm. quite legitimately, whether it's pedophilia or terrorism or whatever. What is the response? There needs to be an appropriate response to that, mm -hmm. and I think civil society uh, doesn't normally take that seriously. Mm -hmm. Bill, um, any best practices uh, here in inviting people um, at the table? Sh yeah. Who's shaking hands with whom? I think, uh, you know, I gather from both the responses, I, th I think there might be some agreement that, I mean, you've just heard from a, a, an expert in cybersecurity, and because it's a very complicated area, that is appropriate. But in terms of shaping policy, we should never have policy made on the basis of any single issue. It has got to be uh, reconciled by the whole ecology of policies that are shaping freedom of expression online. Mm -hmm. Liability. Uh, industrial policy, equity, yeah. privacy, freedom of expression. So just as, you know, we have to respond to the concerns of, of uh, 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 law enforcement, law enforcement has to respond to the concerns of pr privacy and data protection advocates, freedom of expression advocates. So how do we get the whole ecology of public policy on the table and, and so that the, all of these values are, are reconciled in more or less well, uh, but we don't have single issue solutions that lead to travesty in terms of one of the other, other things that are left out of the discussion, I think. Well, and I guess yeah. what's also really mm -hmm. important is to do this evidence-based. I mean, it shouldn't be just one Absolutely. issue and it shouldn't be uh, necessarily new laws each and every time, but a lot of this fear uh, that Professor Debert rightfully addressed as a, as a big risk in fogging this discussion uh, to an extent that it's difficult to, to navigate is coming from industry that wants to sell security technology. Um, and a lot of the reports that are adopted or the findings of reports that are adopted in the mainstream media are not at all challenged for the methods that are used for the findings that were actually uh, you know, coming up. So I think academic research, independent research is incredibly important with different stakeholders um, at the table. And, uh, I'm glad you're saying that and not Bill or I because it would sound really self-serving. Yeah, it would. Said, so. <laughs> no, we I need agree. you. We need you. Um, More funding for universities. Yeah. No, but knowledge <laughs> in this aspect is very important, not only from, from academics, but also, you know, people need to be empowered by their own understanding of technologies. And when it comes to policy in the EU, we can do a lot to mainstream the role that technology plays. So not to see it in an isolated fashion, but to, to say, okay, uh, the EU um, wishes to enlarge with new member states. One of them, for example, is Turkey. Um, Turkey has a lot of problems when it comes to censorship of the internet, when it comes to uh, free speech and press freedom. How can we use the criteria that are already there to incorporate the role that technology plays to ensure that the rights of people in Turkey are 
uh, benefiting from this enlargement negotiation process. Same goes for trade um, policies. Do we need to really export uh, some of these technologies uh, for development? The European Union is still one of the biggest uh, donors of development mm -hmm. aid. We sometimes directly help countries uh, develop an information infrastructure. Why not put in more conditionalities for uh, what can and cannot happen in that network and what it means for people. Okay. So we have a lot of tools that we can use in a more sophisticated way to uh, reflect the role technology plays today. Okay, um, to slowly wrap up the debate, um, our Prime Minister is uh, today uh, dealing with the financial crisis, huge, important, uh, and sometimes the question is posed, how long do we have? Um, I wouldn't want to compare both the issue of today's lecture with the financial crisis, but nevertheless the question, how much time do we have? How much time do we have left to address the challenges and the problems? Um, hearing your lecture, I've got the impression we've got no time left. Um, so how much time do we have left? And if there's time left, what is the first issue on our agenda? Well, I think we're, we've gone beyond, as, as you imply in describing my lecture, a time frame that uh, is, uh, when, it, when it comes to certain changes that are already taking place. Uh, and I think there are some powerful forces driving us uh, in a certain direction that I don't find attractive. Um, for example, one that we didn't really talk much about are technological developments related just to how we communicate. The, the rise of mobile connectivity, I think, is extraordinarily important. There are many good things that we do with mobile technologies, but uh, within the, the ecosystem of mobile, there's an entirely different kind of paradigm of communications because of the, the constraints of the small screen. Information tends to be pushed to you. We download a lot of apps to access information. Each of those apps contain terms of service many of which are 40 pages long that few people read. Uh, and the companies who produce the apps give themselves extraordinary per permissions to do things with our data. Uh, and the, the, that whole mode of communicating is producing this enormous world of big data that's already, uh, to some degree, out of control. And um, you know, to me, these are changes that are happening almost like tectonic forces. And so I'm quite pessimistic, you know, when I add it all up in light of everything else that's going on. However, obviously I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't have a degree of optimism. And uh, when I hear comments that are being made on the panel, things that are going on in, in Europe and in, in the Netherlands as well, in your foreign ministry, uh, among activists worldwide, and even in the private sector, you look at some things that Google is doing and other ISPs uh, in, around the world, uh, gives me hope. So I don't think in terms of time frames per se, I think of ongoing struggle. Okay. Marietje. Well, it is a very urgent issue. I think we're already quite late uh, and all the space that we leave open will be taken up by uh, companies that have a huge interest economically or by other states that seek to push their influence or reclaim their control. Um, so we have to really prioritize this in every way we can, not just as policymakers, although I do think there is a very urgent need for political leadership. Uh, and then this beautiful bottom-up process involving all kinds of actors can, can take, take its, uh, its position. But there is a need for leadership, there is a need for someone or leadership on assessing the bigger picture. It is so massively uh, large an, an issue with so many aspects that it's difficult for one actor to really frame the debate even, or to identify priorities. Uh, and, and I think it is our role and our responsibility to take in, in consideration the public interest, which is often lost. I mean, there may be an interest for, for some company or for another uh, government or anyone else that has a self-interest, but there's also such a thing as the public interest, and that is where I think democratic um, leaders should, should really step in and ensure that democratic principles are upheld, uh, very basic principles such as checks and balances, democratic oversight, uh, human rights, freedom, and also security in the sense of trust. Um, that is really uh, our responsibility, and I would encourage everyone to, um, to urge your representatives to take on this issue uh, with great urgency. And we can even 
make it work in a way that it will benefit uh, the, the challenge of the crisis. I mean, there's a number of issues that are both human rights related and, for example, market development related. Um, companies that would like to do business in China but that are confronted with mass censorship uh, are finding themselves in a bind. Uh, and if we can break through these, these barriers with you know, diplomacy uh, and also uh, with the help of economic development, we can really find a space that will both um, benefit the human rights of the people living in China uh, and the opportunities for our companies to do business in a, in a free manner there. So there's win-wins to be identified too. Okay, so positive. But Bill. Somewhat different answer. I, th I, think, I think there are a lot of inconsistencies in policy right now. I mean, the, probably the best thing countries could do for social and economic development right now is to support the, de the, the vitality of the internet in different countries. Mm -hmm. For SMEs, for individual consumers, uh, for even large businesses, it, that's probably the least I mean, we know that that would support uh, uh, economic development, and yet we're killing it with other things. I, my view is this is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely the beginning. I, I founded the Oxford Internet Institute as a founding director in 2002, and a lot of people said, Bill, why are you doing this? This is just CB radio. The Internet won't be here <laughs> in a couple of years. True. And so even in the early 2000s, a lot of people thought the internet was just a fancy, interesting innovation. Now they know that it is absolutely central, that it is, is absolutely uh, probably the most important uh, in communication infrastructure we've ever had. And it's only now that governments realize they can't leave this alone. And they want in on this, and they're trying to frame their, their problem. So we have to stop s ridiculous policies being passed now, like the data communications bill in the UK, <laughs> for example. <laughs> yeah, but, but, we, uh, but we have to realize that this is just the beginning of a very long debate about how to frame policy around the internet to come up with a paradigm that is more appropriate to the internet and not imposing a broadcasting paradigm on this mm -hmm. and so forth. So get ready. I mean, this is not going to be solved soon. OK. <laughs> well, that's an optimistic uh, <laughs> final word. Thank you very much, all three, uh, for the debate. Ron uh, Diebert, Professor Ron Diebert, thank you very much for your lecture, for coming to Europe. Um, no, he isn't here. Um, I prepared a, a small quote from the, the most recent James Bond film. I don't know whether you've seen that one in, in preparing this debate. My children, age 16, um, typing, um, twittering, etc. said, Mom, you have to see James Bond, Skyfall, because there's the dilemma. Um, uh, who of you, you have seen the most recent and wonderful James Bond movie? Well, those, those of you who haven't, um, I won't market, of course, the James Bond uh, movie here, but, but the dilemma um, we discussed today, in today's lecture, as well as the debate, is in there in the movie. Um, we didn't debate and we didn't discuss today secrecy on the one hand and transparency on the other hand. But um, for those of you who've seen the movie, at one point there's M fighting for her career in front of a parliamentary uh, report committee um, and she fiercely argues that James is the evil creature. Uh, and I quote, she says, um, well, she refers to Bond as a necessary evil, a creature in the shadows, fighting creatures in the shadows. Far better to leave him there with all guns blazing and the lights turned low. I don't know whether that's the ultimate solution in fighting cybercrime, in uh, picking up the challenge between cybersecurity on the one hand and open internet, internet freedom on the other hand. I th I'm more in favor of transparency. But a challenge it will be. Um, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for participating, although not orally, with us here today. Um, there's drinks, of course, but uh, not before thanking a few people, uh, in particular those of the organizing committee of the BAR, who made it all possible. Once again, no snow this year. Two years ago, we had lots of snow. Um, wonderful weather today. 
Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for organizing this, and thank you for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. Drinks is done, sir. Thank you. Thank you.